My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Matt Brennicke. It's uh, June 13th, 2023. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield University in McMinnville. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Uh, first question is why wine? Why wine? Um, as a kid, so I, I grew up in Augusta, Missouri, which is for wine history buffs, it's the first AVA in the country. First place to get a legal designation as a wine growing region. Uh, so I grew up there. And growing up there, there weren't very many jobs that were available to kids. Like you could, you could mow lawns, you could babysit, you could work in a vineyard. And so <laughs> working in the vineyard, my buddy kind of had the lawn business sewn up. And so <laughs> working in a vineyard was an easy thing to take on. It, it was an easy bar for entry, right? I didn't have to know a lot. They would train me on the job. So uh, I started on a vineyard crew at the age of 13, which uh, agriculture, so you could do that. Um, but before that even, uh, my grandparents had a vineyard when I was growing up. And so the first time I ever drove a tractor in a vineyard, I was probably less than 10, you know? So yeah, I mean, vineyards and, and wine and all that stuff was, uh, it was really proximity, right? Just the place where I was born and grew up. From being a field hand for the first few summers, it was my summer job. Uh, by the time I was 17, I was starting to help with harvest duties at, at the winery. Uh, and cleaning tanks and, and running pumps and things like that. Uh, and while it was fascinating, I was not uh, convinced it was a full-time grown-up job. And I was uh, looking forward to going off to college. So uh, I departed town to go to college and got a degree in art education, taught for several years, uh, and then uh, moved back to my hometown uh, to take over my parents' house and uh, had a couple random jobs there for a minute outside of teaching, but then was offered a job again as a cellar master, uh, working for the same winemaker that I'd worked for when I was 17. <laughs> so in my 30s, I took the same job that I had when I was 17, uh, which is a little humbling, but uh, it got me back into the wine biz. And uh, while the pay wasn't phenomenal, there was a uh, lots to learn and that kept me busy. That's probably one of my favorite things about wine is that there's just an infinite amount of stuff to know and any way you point you can find a rabbit hole and just disappear down it and looking for information and there's never, uh, I mean when I was <laughs> managing the vineyards and the winemaking and the, and the whole winery at one point and well, there was never a time when something wasn't on fire or there wasn't a disaster or <laughs> something didn't need to be rewired or bottling line was down. There's always something to keep you busy. So that's why I want. Before we get back to the kind of the forward trajectory at that point, I'm curious about uh, coming from that, from the background, how did art education become something you wanted to focus on? Um, art was always my uh, primary passion, back, especially back then. Uh, less so now. Uh, but no, art was what I wanted to do. And so I kind of I went to school thinking I would be a sculpture major, and uh, my parents had both been educators, and uh, so I took a couple of education classes and thought, you know, I really do like that, and uh, I found myself, my curiosities, like I, I really like to, to learn and get deep onto anything I can grab a hold of for research, and so uh, art is similar to wine in that vein, right? There's any place that you want to look in art, there's an infinite amount of stuff to learn and experience and uh, expertise to be grabbed onto. So you've you've come back into come back to home hometown, taken take, taken over your same job again. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, were you thinking about wine as a long term career, or was it just sort of a stop on the road for you at that point? Um, I wasn't certain. I knew I was done teaching. Uh, I was not looking forward to going back to teaching, uh, and. Um, I knew that there was a lot of experience to be gained in wine, and while the cellar job wasn't super lucrative, that there was still, you know, in a small town, winery town, there were probably five wineries in our town, um, there was always room to grow, right? So there was, there was room to move up, there was uh, a good chance that I would move on beyond that position, but I wanted to understand it in a way that was uh, more thorough. 
and uh, so working in the cellar was great for that. So tell me about that education process then for yourself, coming back to it at that point. Uh, what did you think you kind of knew about wine at, at that point, and what did you still have to learn? Um, well, I knew the mechanics and the rhythm of the season, right? I knew the basics of winery equipment operation, um, but I didn't necessarily know the whys. You know, like, how do I, okay, so we're, stuff to goes to barrels, it goes to barrels this long, but what's the whole process going on inside of there? You know, like, I had rough understandings, but not, um, not the details and not the, uh, certainly not the knowledge to go on and, and run the winery myself at that point. You know, mm -hmm. so I was really uh, grateful for uh, the ability to work under the winemaker and at their direction. And uh, <clears throat> then, you know, we had good books in the, in the lab to read. Uh, and anytime I did a, a major process, I would make sure I had the books out and was, you know, reading the details and trying to find out more about the whys. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was a great experience to kind of do all the execution with very low risk of failure, right? <laughs> Somebody's handing me a sheet of paper that says, rack these barrels to this tank, then add this additive and, you know, blend it for 20 minutes and then cap it all back up. Um, you know, there, so there was, I got more involved in the process, obviously, because I was doing most of the execution, but then also I got the... I gained a lot of understanding in that first four years or so. What about on the, on the other end of it? What about from the kind of the consumer end of it? Were you a fan of wine? Did you drink wine much? Yeah, um, I did, but I wouldn't say um, that I was really passionate or knowledgeable about it. You know, even even as a winemaker, uh, that was a really common question for customers to ask you. It's like, oh, so are you a sommelier? Do you like travel the world drinking wine? It's like, no, I. I'm stuck in this winery, I, I never leave here. <laughs> I barely get to take a vacation. I drink these eight wines and I know them very well. <laughs> you know? It was, it, so no, I didn't have a broad uh, wine experience, but having grown up with it, uh, I did have an appreciation for it for sure. So tell us about the, the sort of trajectory for yourself from there, coming back as cellar master and like you say, kind of having mentorship and learning the ropes. Tell me about uh, kind of growing up into the role and, and figuring out what came next. What came next came by attrition mostly. Uh, as it does in the industry. Uh, the, at one point in my work as a cellar master, the, the vineyard manager left. And uh, they said, you know, they'd put in there two weeks and they, uh, the owner came to me and said, hey, do you think you could run the vineyard? And I said, yeah, sure, of course, right? Which, I don't know if you're familiar with the Richard Branson, but it, he says, anytime somebody asks you if you could do a thing, the answer is always yes, and then you drop back and figure it out. So, <laughs> I would kind of based on that philosophy, of course I could run the vineyard. Like, sure. Like, I knew how tractors worked, right? But to be honest, I could barely back a trailer at the time, which, if you ever worked in vineyards, that's a pretty key skill. <laughs> you do it a lot. So, um, yeah, I had a really crash course there with the, the uh, previous uh, vineyard manager learning, you know, spray schedules and you know, chemicals and tractors and just all the things. And uh, and then I really enjoyed that experience going, moving from the cellar out to the vineyard and um, I got a broader understanding of like what it takes to deliver good fruit to the vineyard, like why is a crop big sometimes, not other times out of the same vineyard. And now like there's a whole new series of levers to pull, you know, to manipulate the, the fruit into becoming what you want it to be on the before it hits the crush pad. So that was a great experience there. And obviously you mentioned uh, there's a management aspect to that as well, so lead, leading people. So tell me about kind of growing into that part as well. That wasn't so hard for me because I'd been a school teacher and I grew up in Boy Scouts and I was like, you know, the, the senior patrol leader. So I was actually running people as a young person, uh, helping people, you know, deal with logistics and organization and uh, coaching and, and things like that. <clears throat> so that wasn't a, a particular challenge. In fact, um, the bigger thing to, to deal with there was like the culture shock from the previous guy to me. Mm -hmm. You know, he had run a pretty loose ship and, you know, it was things were getting done, but maybe not the way I wanted them. And then there was um, 
attitude and personnel issues and you know the oftentimes the, the the type of adults who are willing to work out in the sun they've got their own special challenges you know and so um, learning their culture learning you know how to motivate them in in positive ways and and that kind of thing was a challenge at first but the but like knowing and asking people to do things for me that wasn't so hard it was more of a getting a hold of the culture and kind of shifting it into something that worked for me rather than the culture that had been there for the previous guy what came next more of that i mean like um I got to really understanding the vines and things like that. Um, I really loved uh, mowing the vineyards with the brush hog because you've got eyes on the vines all day, and you know within the course of a couple of days a week, you end up seeing all of your vines really pretty close, and you can stop and say, "Oh wow, I've got hints of black rot showing up. I need to adjust my next you know spray or whatever." So there was, I learned a lot that way, um, and then uh, a few years later the winemaker was moving on to another winery and they asked me did they think I could do the winemaker's job and same situation right I knew the mechanics I knew the order of operations I knew all of the basic stuff but I'd never been the decision maker right so a little intimidating um, but uh, like I said we had good resources there um, by that time, the internet was really easy to, you know, figure things out with, and there were calculators to use for determining additions and stuff like that. I wasn't, you know, doing longhand math on on pieces of paper anymore. So, um, yeah, I knew I could do it. Um, touch of imposter syndrome, but I said, sure, I'll take that on. And um, <clears throat> at the time, I had a pretty good crew in the vineyard, um, along with a a lady who joined the team who was ready to be, she could take on more responsibility. And so um, I asked for her promotion and then said I could maintain both departments. I could I would start seven in the morning, manage the vineyard for an hour, get them all on their tasks for the day, step up to the winery and then run their winery for the rest of the afternoon. And uh, that worked pretty well. Uh, of course, there were times when there were urgent emergencies in the vineyard and I had to pop out to to deal with that kind of stuff in the middle of the day. So some things got awkward, but um, for the most part, that was really doable and, and possible. So tell me about making those decisions for the first time. You mentioned like in, with the winemaker shoes on, you have to make those final calls and everything. So uh, first time making some of those decisions, did you feel confident? I mean, confident maybe, but I triple checked everything I did for sure. And I still like, even as, as I was training seller masters and, and stuff in the future, uh, triple checking was one of my core principles, right? You, you, you do the math, you stop and think, does that math make sense? <laughs> Am I sure? Right, you go look at the tank, is this, yep, it's the right tank, measure the wine again, okay, it's the right wine, you know, double check your labels, write it down one more time, okay, now we're good to go. Um, so yeah, I, hesitant but sure, I guess is a good way to say it. I don't know that confidence is a great way to say it, but, uh, yeah, when some of my first wines were all the way released and in the bottle and judged, you know, uh, very well against other wines in Missouri, which is where I came from, uh, I was, you know, I felt justified, right? You know, you, you feel like in a, you, the imposter syndrome rides pretty hard on you at first. You're like, man, I'm, I'm really doing this thing, you know, <laughs> and it was, it was tricky. Uh, but yeah, having some wines well received by both the public and by critics and stuff was a, that was special, and I knew for sure that I had something. That that first bottle that comes off the line with your name on the back is pretty special. Was there a kind of a, a marketing component or a sort of a forward public facing role with that, with that as well? Um, not marketing so much uh, until later. Um, the, the owner of the winery at the time that I became the winemaker, um, he was more the face of the winery at that point. Um, but it was still, uh, we did private tastings with the winemaker and things like that, and I definitely did uh, wine dinners. Uh, at the winery I worked, we made port, and it was very well known, and um, we'd been doing it for many years, and so we had a library of different levels of port and different styles of port, and we would have a port dinner, 
a couple times a year. And so leading that port dinner for the first time was really, you know, that was pretty special. You have a few hundred people there and they're, you know, they're there to taste my wines and, and the wines that came before me. So I was representing not just myself, but the, the previous winemakers and the, and the company. Uh, and then the community had some events as well that were wine related. Uh, winemakers dinners where the, the public, like a lot of public came together for an event and you know, I would speak with the other, along, represent my wines along with other winemakers from other facilities doing the same. So yeah, that was, that was fun. I'm curious about the feeling for you. Like you said, the first one that comes off the line with your name on the back of it, it's a, it's a different thing. So uh, tell me about sort of facing the public or facing that kind of a situation where it is your name and, and what, what, what kind of feeling was it? What kind of, uh, uh, what, what kind, were you kind of, how were you trying to sort of portray yourself at that point? Well, I kind of had the story, right? I mean, I grew up in that valley. I'd been in the wine industry since I was a kid. The locals knew me. The locals were glad to see me come back and be in the wine industry again. Um, and, um, you know, some of the same people were in the wine scene, you know, that 20 years later or whatever when I did come back. So um, it was, uh, I don't know, I felt welcomed. It was, it was not a, a difficult thing for me. It was nice to um, have a few vintages come out and, and do well and then you believed it for real yourself, you know, and then it was really easy to, to uh, interact with the public in a positive way. And generally people are at the winery to enjoy themselves. I mean, occasionally you get somebody who's, a, who's I don't know, a, an amateur critic and they want to tell you the flaws that they're picking out and stuff like that, and that's fine. But in general, people are there to have a good time but, and they're, they're happy to be tasting your wines and just hearing the information, you know. I love to give the tours. At the at there was Mount Pleasant Winery it was the winery that I worked with uh, the, for the most of my career, and uh, they had cellars dating back to the 1850s. And uh, to go down into those spaces and show people around and you know talk about what it feels like to uh, you know be walking in the same footprints as somebody who's done something you know with the same goals and the same same different tools, mm -hmm. same goals, same same aspirations for you know such a long period of time, pretty impressive. So tell me about um, sort of developing your own sort of winemaking philosophy or winemaking style. Mm. Uh, obviously you, you took over a brand it's, it, as an owner that's not entirely all your decision, of course, but right. you're gonna imprint yourself on the wine. So tell me what it was that you sort of wanted to be your signature or wanted to be sort of recognizable as your wine. There, there was a push there for um, more light-bodied, elegant wines, and a lot of the varietals that we were working with were uh, hybrids and stuff, and so uh, some of them didn't lend themselves to that very well, and I really was an advocate for um, like expressing the varietal as not necessarily as boldly as possible, but as clearly as possible. Um, there was a particular varietal in Missouri, the state grape there is Norton, uh, sometimes called Cynthiana, um, and that is, it's, an, it's a really acid forward, spicy, really super inky black grape. And a lot of other winemakers went out of their way to mask it as much as possible. And uh, I said, no, I don't, you know, this grape is really super aggressive. You know, it's, a, it's not a subtle glass of wine. It kind of grabs you by your shirt collar and gives you a headbutt, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's in your face. And so I, like, I want to make a really in your face Norton. Mm -hmm. And so I did that with that. Um, there was another grape called Vignol that just had these wonderful uh, light tropical flavors and it was kind of zesty. And uh, other people sometimes would harvest it later and try to fight that zest and fight the acids and I thought no I really like the way it is when it's really bright you know and so I, I went out of the way to to make that happen um, so I would say my wines were maybe more bold I tried to get a lot of uh, expression in the nose so I changed some of our winemaking practices to try to uh, uh, bring out uh, esters and thiols and things that, that weren't uh, being expressed in the way that things had, had been done. Um, and I think there wasn't much pushback on that, you know? As soon as the wines were being well received, then it was, 
and it was good. And I worked with the owner pretty closely in the lab um, to like, I mean, I was always parading into his office with a glass, hey, you gotta try this, you know, what do you think of this? And um, so I kind of was an advocate for my style and the owner came along pretty nicely. Tell us a little bit about the region. Obviously you mentioned a, a very old AVA, a historic AVA. What was the kind of the, what was the, the customer base? What was the reputation of sort of the wine area you were in, uh, both, local, both locally and on a more national scale? So on a national scale, really just the name, you know, the, the AVA being out there first is probably the only real major recognition. We had some uh, involvement in the uh, phylloxera epidemic, you know, back then we had, we had sent vines to Europe to try to solve problems and that some of those came from Missouri. Um, so there was some notoriety there maybe. Um, and pre-prohibition, Missouri was a pretty big producer, right? Um, Post-prohibition, Augusta was one of the first AVAs in the Midwest to kick back off. Uh, started back up in the 60s. I um, uh, got experience in Iowa through my, the company that I worked for. And they didn't really start again after prohibition until the 90s and, and early 2000s. And so a very different wine culture there. I haven't been, <clears throat> you know, just that, that gap, you know, made a difference. Um, in terms of what made the valley unique, um, if you look at the Missouri River on a map, it goes south, 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 and then kind of has a bend in it and turns north to go back to St. Louis. Well, right in the bottom of that bend is the town of Augusta and the, and the surrounding AVA. Um, and they're surrounded by a set of limestone hills. And the Missouri River kind of sits where the very, uh, the, the furthest south that a glacial pass ever happened. And so there are some glacial soils, there's limestone soils, there's sandy soils, um, but all of it is in a bowl that sits um, facing the Missouri River to its south. And so the, the, the ridges are all kind of um, southeast facing. And so in the morning you get a nice river fog that fills up the whole bowl. And then as the sun comes up, a breeze moves up the hills and the, the vines are dried off pretty early and the uh, sun sets kind of uh, off the way and so a lot of the vines go to bed cool and dry and, and pretty good environment. Uh, compared to Oregon, you guys have a much less uh, disease pressure than Missouri. Missouri has super hot summers, super cold winters, and a lot of issues with um, just dampness in the vineyard. It's hard to keep vines dried out and so there's always you know, some kind of disease trying to show up on the vines. We spray a lot more than you guys do. There's a lot less people trying to even say that they're organic. You know, we made our best to be sustainable. We use as little spray as possible, but um, there were some challenges, in the, especially in, the, in that, not in, not in Augusta in particular, but I think in Midwest winemaking. What about like on a client base? Was it most, mostly local that you were selling or was, it, was there more than that? Um, so Augusta is, um, a tourist destination from St. Louis. Uh, it's about 40 minutes west of St. Louis. So there was a pretty steady clientele all summer and fall, um, dropping off in the hot months of the summer. But uh, in the fall, it was a very popular thing to go out to the wineries and see the leaves and stuff like that. So um, I think there was a, there were some international travel to our area, but not specifically for that destination. It was just a, a side trip from something else that people were doing. Um, but I will say there's a new investor there who bought up pretty much all of the wineries in that region, um, minus one or two. Um, and they are aiming to make it a, a tourist destination of its own. So they're planning a golf course and major hotels, um, that kind of thing. And um, Work, they actually were the last owners in the winery before I left. But so big investments going in there and potentially could be uh, a destination of its own. So how long were you at Mount Pleasant and, and what were some of your, what were some of, as you look at it, what were some of the biggest accomplishments for you there? What were some of the things you, you look back on proudest? I was there about 12 years um, and I would say in terms of accomplishments, I had some wines that that uh, scored very, very well compared to similar wines from Missouri. And so that was nice to know that um, 
you know, technically and and you know, the expression of wine that I was able to to make wines from the same fruit as other folks, but you know, that they stood well against the you know the wines that were existing. Um, I was proud of the way that I was able to put together the culture of the winery over time. You know, I, I obviously I moved up through an existing culture, but then by the time you're the general manager, some of the culture of the winery is up to you, and the storytelling and the the, the way that the uh, people present wines at the tasting room and and all of that stuff I got to train in there. Um, and so I felt pretty good about the way that I'd made some of those changes. Um, I'd also done a lot of the photography. Um, you know, when you're out in the vineyards early in the morning, you get the most beautiful sunrises and, and you know, the fog in the valley and, the, you know, water droplets on the leaves and the grape bunches starting to turn in Verasion. And so I had years worth of uh, photography that's part of their advertising still. And then they've got uh, big prints of my photos on the walls inside still, so I appreciate that stuff as well. And then it, there's something to being that kind of, um, I don't know, local celebrity, uh, you know, in, the, in that area, winemakers are pretty well thought of and, and uh, you get recognized and talked to about your wines on a regular basis and so that was fun too. So you mentioned the general manager side of things, so, so tell me about building a team and about sort of defining the story that's going to be told or, or helping kind of guide the story that's going to be told. How did you, what were you looking for Was you were building a team there and what were you sort of looking for the portrayal of the winery to be? Sure. Um, well, in that region, we were one of the first to start charging for tastings. At the time, it had been um, kind of a free-for-all and you ended up with um, kind of a parade of party buses that would stop for the tasting and then hop back on the bus and leave and go to the next tasting and the next tasting. And we were one of the first to not do that. Um, and at the time, we were, uh, when I first started in the wine department, um, we were still producing for the grocery store market in a big way. Um, and the owner and I and, and the other winemaker there worked on kind of just doing the math to see is having a really large production and really inexpensive wines the way to stay, or can we market a more high-end wine and you know increase the margins in the winery and drop back on the on the other side? Um, for better or worse, we pursued that direction. And by the time I was the general manager, we were a pretty high-end wine uh, uh, establishment, and the wines were not uh, not cheap. Right. Uh, we still made some wines for the grocery store, but it was much less of our focus. And then um, we had uh, basically a philosophy that, you know, if you sold out of a wine prior to being able to restock it, that you just increase the price so that the next year you wouldn't run into that problem. Right. Well, we were able to do that enough times that our wines were, were fairly expensive. And I found our salespeople when I came on were apologetic about that to the customers. And I was like, okay, we. We can't. We can't be doing that. We have to. We have to justify this. You know, this is this is this is where our wines sell, and here's why. And um, so, little things like that, um, how to present the bottle, you know, knowing, making sure that everybody from the janitor to the the people at the tasting bar, to the chefs and everybody knew our story. Like, why are we who we are? Where do we belong in the history of this valley? You know, where do our wines stand in the world? And and things like that. Um, and trying to get everybody to be comfortable articulating that the best they could and then try to just kind of keep that story cohesive and um, make sure that when we gave tours that when I gave tours they went a certain way right when somebody else gave tours of course they're going to be a little different but how can we bend the story back to where we're all telling the kind of the same the same tales before we move on I want to ask about vineyards a little bit because obviously you mentioned that was kind of one of the steps in the process so I'm curious about as you grew comfortable vineyard work and started to see more and more vineyard. Tell me about sort of the evaluation of a vineyard. Uh, what, what do you, uh, what were you sort of looking for in a vineyard and what, especially if you're introduced to a new site or, or something like that, how do you evaluate it and um, how do you kind of know what needs to be done to maybe make a vineyard more the, the way you want it to be? If you show up at any given time, a vineyard is at one stage of its life, right? Um, so if you're there in dormancy and it's not been pruned back, you can see a lot. You can see like, okay, there's way too many canes on this vine or uh, that kind of thing. You can kind of get a sense of like, is the structure of the vine 
correct? Do I need to, we did a lot of mechanical uh, pruning, harvesting, everything, so our vines were all one, one vine per post and all tied tight to the post as often as we could. But we had a lot of older vineyards that needed to be renewed and brought up because they still had the, the vines that came way out into the aisle and that was hard for mechanical pickers and all that kind of stuff. So some things like that were super obvious, like, okay, we need, you know, we need mechanical correction, right? We can't, we gotta renew some of these vines and that kind of thing. Um, but I think you get that best by seeing the, the vineyard over time, right? I mean, when you uh, see a vineyard at bloom, you've got a certain sense of like, okay, there's gonna be enough fruit or there's not gonna be enough fruit or we've got way too much fruit, you know. Uh, all of those things start to become visible at that time. And then later on um, in the year, you can see, okay, well, we've got way too much vigor or we don't have enough vigor. These vines could have more canopy. Um, so I think it's, it's in order to evaluate a vineyard effectively, you, I mean, obviously you wanna know your soils. You could do some soil sampling, you can do petiole sampling, you can get the data, right? But um, kind of living with a vineyard for a full season or multiple seasons, you can see like, how does it compare to what it's looked like before in the past, you know? And that's really the, I think where you need to, to have the understanding and, and be able to, that gives you the, the real ability to kind of forecast what you want to do there in the future. Um, I'm sure that you could just pop into a vineyard and look at one point, but you'd have a, a, such a limited amount of information unless you really knew that people had been in, involved with it in the past. I mean, assuming the place is healthy. If, it, uh, if all the vines are spindly and have, you know, suckers coming out everywhere, then you, there's obviously a different problem. <laughs> Could evaluate that pretty easily. Yeah, right. If there's something wrong, then it should be it should stand out to you no matter what time of year. But uh, the subtleties you really kind of have to see over time. So, what was next for you after Mount Pleasant? The Mount Pleasant was bought by a a, a guy who bought up a bunch of wineries and um, had pretty grand uh, ideas, and was part of the promotion of me to general manager. There was to help execute his ideas and stuff, um, and. You know, and you, you get a big shift like that, then you have to drop back and decide, like, do I still fit in this place? Do I want this, you know? And um, I just didn't, I was n not happy with the direction that it was gonna take me in that place. Um, and so I was ready to move on and I did. Uh, and I kind of jumped out with no parachute. I didn't have a plan. I knew that I wanted a different job and that that job was um, grinding me and I'd, I'd kind of lost the joy in it for a bit. And I didn't want to do that with wine or with you know, anything I, I like. If I can't be passionate about my work, I don't enjoy it. And so um, I stepped out there and um, I had just bought a whole bunch of winemaking equipment from a company called De Franceschi uh, and I was familiar with their equipment because I'd used their presses for years. Um, I was really happy with their equipment. So when it came time to make a new equipment purchase, I purchased from DeFranceschi uh, a bunch of new stuff and I was excited to get to use it. But I ended up leaving before I really did use it. So um, I had enough money saved up that I was gonna take a vacation because working in wine, you don't always get to. And so um, I was on a motorcycle in Colorado when I got a phone call from the people at DeFranceschi asking like, hey, how, how's that new equipment working out? I'm like, uh, actually, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> so I don't know, but here's the people you can call and talk to. And they said, well, what are you doing right now? I'm like, well, I'm on a motorcycle in Colorado. So what are you gonna be doing when you get back? I don't know. And so they said, um, would you be interested in talking about a job with us? So I'd be interested in talking about any job pretty much, but yeah, you, you, could, you could talk me into something. Let's, let's talk about what's possible. And, um, they had always been represented by a third party and they had just started out the year before uh, representing themselves, uh, but they really needed a salesperson and somebody to spearhead the, the sales and the social media and stuff like that. And they asked me if I'd be interested and uh, I said, yeah, you, you know, I don't, I don't have a, a whole sense of what the job entails, talk to me about what it is, you know, kind of make a pitch to me and, and they did and it, it seemed good. And uh, so now I work from home and travel 
visit wineries all the time, and uh, I get to help winemakers get the best equipment, evaluate what their needs are, um, you know, find the the bottlenecks in their collection. You know, like with it, like let's say you've got a crush pad, but you need to ramp up production. What are the pieces that hold you back? You know, I know from experience what those tend to be. You know, and so sometimes when a in a smaller winery or an inexperienced crew, maybe they don't know what that is, or maybe they need, you know, an objective view from the outside to come in and look. And so I can do that pretty well. And then I understand the business from um, almost every angle, right? And so um, that makes it pretty comfortable to walk into a winery. I understand the folks that are at the desk are not really directly involved with the winemaking. <laughs> I know. The winemaker is busy; doesn't necessarily have time to see a salesman, you know, all the time. So there's, I don't know. It's a pretty nice fit. Um, not only, I mean, do I understand the equipment, but I've I've literally used it. You know, I've got programs on the on our presses that I like for different grapes, and I can help you know people program their presses in ways that make them more effective for them. And then I understand the terminology, mm -hmm. which I think would be hard for somebody. Like you've just got to. A person who had been in sales but was selling, I don't know, cars, and then you move into the wine industry, you know, yeah, you can learn some of the tem terminology, but unless you've, you know, suffered through filtering something the third time and not getting what you wanted or, you know, all of those things, you don't really feel the pain of your customers or understand the, the, where they're really coming from. So I, it's been a really nice fit so far. You have the scars to prove it. More than a few, literally. <laughs> So as, uh, did they, was there an indication as to uh, why they were attracted to you for that position? They had come down and done the typical wine and dine thing, trying to make the sale. It was a pretty good sized sale for them. Um, we were really upscaling the, the production at the winery. They wanted to potentially triple the winery's production in three years. Um, and so we needed new things. And they also wanted ultra premium wine. So we brought in an optical sorter and roll feeders and vibrating hopper and a closed drum press and you know like everything was completely different so um, them walking me through what was possible and that kind of stuff took a lot of back and forth negotiation and talking and stuff like that and they I guess I felt that I had the the gift of gab and the and the all the things that that make you potentially a good salesperson and they didn't really want hardcore uh, aggressive sales they wanted somebody that could um, it's an Italian firm and some of the stereotypical things about Italians are true. And one of them is they really want to be interacting like family with the people that they work with. And they want to get to know their customers and they really spend a lot of time with them. And so they felt like I had some of the characteristics that it would take to develop those relationships and maintain them comfortably. Uh, what were the biggest initial sort of challenges for you? What did you, uh, obviously you, you had the technical, you had the sort of the, the, you kind of understood the equipment. So what was the biggest learning curve? I guess just keeping track of how many things are in the air at one time. You know, in the in a winery, I had systems for all of that, and uh, coming in as a new salesperson in a company that didn't have a lot of uh, internal sales experience. I mean, we're, their parent company is enormous. It's a it's Sacme Group is a is a really big multinational corporation that is everywhere. Um, so it's not like they don't have the support. It's just that there wasn't a there's no, there wasn't a prescribed direction for how we're going to take the company. It was kind of like, hey, you're the sales guy, now go ahead, you know? <laughs> and so um, basically though, we started out with existing customers and branching out from there, but the branching out, like how do you identify new prospects? You know, I go to all the trade shows, the, the biggest ones anyway, and that's a great way to find prospects and stuff like that, but I still knock on wineries doors and ask if I can see the members of the production team for a minute, hand them a piece of paper telling them what we do and give them my card and ask if they got any needs immediately. Stuff like that's a little, a little awkward the first dozen times you do it. It gets easier. Um, but you know, deciding how to represent the company in social media and all those things were things I had sort of done with the winery, but it's a different game. You know? So there's a learning curve there for sure. Tell me about evaluating needs. You mentioned that was a big part of what you do. Is if you get to meet with the staff, if you get to see the space, you're evaluating needs. So, tell me about kind of sizing up someone's operation and figuring out what, where, you know, what might best fit. A lot of times, that's a factor that they're aware of. Um, 
they know they're growing. I mean, they don't reach out. People don't, wineries, winery equipment lasts a really long time, most of it. You're not usually replacing a press because um, your last press died. I mean, occasionally, right? Um, but more often than not, you realize that you're either working with something that's outdated or too small. You need to upscale. And so um, one of the things that um, I had to do at Mount Pleasant was exactly that, solve that problem. We're going we're gonna to really ramp up production. What's it going to take? You know, volume-wise, what are, do we need more tank space? Do we need more uh, equipment? Whatever. Uh, and at Mount Pleasant, we had been doing that uh, like larger production for the grocery store wine. So we had the tank facilities that we needed. We just didn't have the crush facilities that we needed to, to keep up. Um, and so we had to upscale that. And so in doing that, I learned a lot that way. And um, I don't know, there's a dialogue that you work out with the production team and the people who are actually doing the production about what do you like and how do you like to do it. And uh, one of the neat things about De Franceschi is almost everything they do is custom made. They don't have stock presses for sale. They don't have stock tanks for sale. Everything is made to order. So how do you like it? And if you don't know how you like it, I can show you some options and talk about you know how your workflow might be and things like that. And um, that uh, that seems to be really helpful and, and um, that kind of thing. The other thing that we have is our presses are programmable. And so they have a series of set programs in there that work different ways in terms of pressing like sequentially or um, you know progressively. That, but they, um, a lot of winemakers are only familiar with what they've done so far, mm -hmm. right? You learn from somebody hands-on. You might learn some stuff in school. But until you are presented with new things right in front of you, you don't know why, why would I do that or how would I solve this problem. And so um, as I progress you know, in this career, I'm finding new other people's ways of doing things fascinating. Because mm -hmm. there's a there's a, a hundred ways that you can crush fruit, you know? The same the same same block, same lot, same everything. If you gave it to ten winemakers, it would come out with ten different wines, you know? And so how they process it, how they handle it, is, and hearing that story from them um, is kind of fascinating on my end and that gives me new information the next time I go to a winery and see what they've got. Like, oh, hey, I met these guys in Oregon. They're doing this. You know, you guys might benefit from that. Oh, that sounds neat. You know? So on that note, let's talk about why Oregon. How did, how did you end up here? I travel, my territory is everywhere from Mexico to Canada. Um, so from Ensenada, Mexico to Niagara, you know, I keep, you know, a pretty steady travel. Um, but every time I've come, when I go visit wineries, that it's kind of a, I'm, I'm a little spoiled in this job in that, you know, when you go to wine regions, they're typically really beautiful, right? There aren't too many just like hideous in the middle of nowhere, uh, places you don't want to be uh, where there's wine. It's usually like scenic and beautiful and I like to hike. And so um, I try to find time in those trips to like get outdoors and, and enjoy the area, get a taste of the local foods and, and wines and beers, et cetera. And Oregon was just like fascinating. It's first first time I had a trip here, went out to Hood River and uh, visited a client there and got to spend some time in the gorge. And then the next time I came out, I got to go to the coast. And it just fascinated, right? <clears throat> and I was at a point in my life where I could freely move. And um, I talked to the company about it. And they were not only not opposed, but they were willing to help, you know. and. Um, there's a lot of growth going on in this area in terms of wineries, and uh, we already have a pretty good set of clientele here. And one of the things I kept hearing was that um, they wanted to know that we had a presence in the valley, right? Do, do you have somebody here, or is all your people, or all your people in California, or all your people? My company's based in Iowa. All your people in Iowa. Well, at the time that was true. You know, all of our people were based in either California, Tennessee, or or Iowa, and so. Um, People wanted to know that they could, you know, get somebody face to face, get some hands on if their equipment went wrong or whatever. And so it was, you know, I had heard several times that we we would love to buy from a company that's local, mm -hmm. that's got at least local representation. And so um, we have the Bay Area covered pretty well. So um, you know, 
California all the way up to Napa and stuff like that. We're within an hour or so a way of being able to be in Napa in a quick uh, minute. But um, our other core areas are like some parts of the Midwest and, and New York City, or not, not New York City, New York State. Mm -hmm. And um, and we have a little bit of all over the place, but uh, Oregon is pretty central to us and pretty core uh, in terms of our customer base. And so it seemed a good place to be. Plus, I would really excited to be here. <laughs> it shows. Uh, so I'm curious then, with that said, what were your, what have been or what were your initial impressions of the wine industry here, both of the, the people making it and of the wines themselves? I had experienced um, more of California and New York before I got to Oregon. And so the thing that impressed me most about the winemakers themselves is how um, kind of down to earth they are, easy going. You know, it's very much more like the Midwest. Um, they aren't personally pretentious or I'm not saying everybody everywhere is but um, they're really approachable and, and kind easy to talk to um, there's kind of a Pacific Northwest vibe of you know a little more laid back a little more hey however you want to do it let's do it that way you know that kind of stuff so um, I appreciated that and then um, in terms of their production uh, there's a wide variety, you know, and you're seeing um, the varietals that are used up here, like even just Pinot, this, there's, everybody's doing it differently. And people have some, some really fascinating things that they're doing, whether they're, you know, doing whites on the skins or they're, uh, they're pressing stuff directly to barrels or... And then on the West Coast in general, there's a lot of people who don't make very many additions to the wine at all. They're very hands-off and let the, the, the vineyard speak for itself and their, and their processes. And um, in the Midwest, that's almost not possible. You know? And so to go from where I'm pulling maybe 40, 50 levers to make a wine go from beginning to end, to watch people be like, we're just pushing it into here and you know, we'll monitor it and we know what we want and we're gonna get what we want, but we're, we're gonna have maybe four inputs the whole time. You know? it's, that's fascinating to watch. The, the quality of the fruit that you guys are capable of here is just, you know, it's different than, than what, I'm, what I'm used to working with, and it's kind of fascinating. In the time you've been here, which I know obviously hasn't been that long yet, but uh, what have you seen as sort of the, what is, what is Oregon going to need from, from someone like you? What, what are the biggest sort of like uh, growth opportunities, I guess, for what you're selling? I have to kind of flip that because I, um, I think that what my company um, needs more of is recognition. You know, we, there's some other bigger uh, competitors, right? But um, our stuff is, is very unique in that uh, we put a lot of effort into the aesthetics of it and the technology of it. Like for example, we make um, custom designed wine tanks that can look like anything. We have customers who have wine tanks that are black pyramids with a gold top you pop the top off to get into access the, you know, we have um, some of the biggest houses in Bordeaux have our, our tanks and they, I mean, it looks like a jewelry box that you're shrunk yourself down into and walked inside of. It's, you know, purple tanks that are upside down cones that go way up to the ceiling, um, bright blue, bright green, whatever, and it's, and in any kind of shape, you know, and then we build the, the building to go around the, the tanks and so the, the quick pitch for that that type of stuff is that in the era of Facebook and Instagram, everything that your customer sees goes online. And so if your production facility looks like just a regular production facility, that's fine. But if you could walk into one that was like the whole place is eye popping, right? You put as much thought into the back of the house as you do into the tasting room, then we've got that opportunity. And so um, whether that's something that the folks in Oregon are going to be jumping up and down about I can't say, but I know that I've, I've spoken to some architecture firms who are working on some, some future projects where that might be a possibility here. Um, but more than that, we just need, we need recognition in the, in the, in the, the industry here to, to be able to say, hey, this is what we're offering and here's how it's different. And uh, both the aesthetics, the durability of our machines and the and the, the quality of the technology, I think, are, are superior. I mean, not that the, our competitors are making lousy products, but I can stand behind our stuff and say probably that we're, 
we do a good thing with it. And you, you mentioned obviously a pretty steady travel schedule and, and, and seeing other parts. So uh, from your kind of from your perspective, how in addition to kind of what you've already talked about in terms of the sort of personality here, how does Oregon fit in the in the sort of national wine scene? And nationally, in the public, everybody's brain goes to Napa, right? That's the that's the mecca of the American wine world. But I think there's a lot of respect for Oregon and the Pacific Northwest in general. And uh, I mean, the, there are certain wines that come out of Oregon that you're not gonna top in California, you know? Um, and even if you, you know, variety is part of the beauty of wine, right? And, you know, looking at a soil map of just the Willamette Valley, never mind the rest of Oregon, the, the variety of terrain and soils and environments and little microclimates that you guys have is just phenomenal. And so to taste a Pinot from, you know, volcanic soils way up high to take another one that's, you know, coastal or whatever, it's, it's fascinating to me that what you guys have and, uh, and what's, being, what's being made here. The, as far as in the in the industry, there's a lot of growth happening here. New new facilities going in, places expanding, uh, foreign investment. So you know, um, I'm not tied into the politics of the wine world here yet, but I'm sure that's fascinating. Um, but yeah, there's a lot happening. You know, so I think Oregon is not only well established as as it's what it is, but also is up and coming. There's I think there's a expectation that not only as a as a place for quality wines but as a tourism destination as well you know post pandemic i think you're starting to see that stuff come back i saw an article the other day about the willamette valley being one of the number one places to visit in the united states and so you can see that building over time you know and gaining some momentum that'd be a really good thing here in oregon Tell me about your uh, sort of continuing wine education for yourself. Obviously, a d totally different role for you now. Um, how do you, how has your wine education continued in this role? And uh, are there things you're looking forward to in the future in that regard? I would say the majority of it is coming through direct interaction with my clients. You know, I learn a lot about how other people make wine. You know, you can't, <clears throat> the, not a lot of what I grew up doing. Uh, certain things in wine are just, it's the same everywhere. But there's, a, there's not enough crossover for me to just believe that I know what that person's doing. So when I get to meet somebody, and it depends on how much time there is, but to pick their brain and, and know, okay, she's got you know, this way of doing things, and it's entirely different than, than what, I, uh, what I know. And that's fascinating. And then you get to talk shop in a re very real way and gain some information, some insights. Um, then, you know, I follow the tr trade magazines um, and then LinkedIn, you know, like there's a lot, you can learn a lot just following other winery social media, following winemakers on LinkedIn. Uh, Wine Business Monthly is a great resource. Um, and then, you know, the the for the public trade magazine that's like wine spectator and things like that are, are worth following i wouldn't say that i necessarily learn a lot about the the making of wine but where wine is going and and what the futures are and that kind of stuff is available that way and kind of on that note tell us about sort of what you're looking ahead to for yourself obviously settling in a new place and a new role um, are there sort of uh, things on your kind of future horizon goals or or uh, projects you're going to undertake i think it would be early days for me to talk about like a new a new project or something, but no, I'm still kind of settling into establishing the, the, the media for the company, that kind of thing. Um, there are ways I want to streamline my work. Uh, some of it's kind of cumbersome the way that I do it now. Um, there are things that I think um, technology will help with there. Um, and then, no, I think more more travel, more expansion, like to get to know more people, more places, and uh, and it's but here in particular to plug in with more the local wine scene and uh, you know any <clears throat> any wine region, there are micro and macro things happening, right? And usually there's a core group of people who are starting to they're they're the ones that that are they touch all of those little circles. And so to try to find and plug myself in with 
that kind of stuff. But probably the most difficult thing in wine equipment sales is finding somebody who's starting a new project. And so trying to find the ways into like people who are whose ear to, are to the ground for that kind of thing. Um, and finding a way to do that would be the most helpful thing for me. Uh, so the same question, but kind of more personal level. Anything else you're looking forward to beyond wine and the job? Oh yeah, I mean, hiking up here is amazing. <laughs> I've gone a couple couple uh, longer hikes already, but um, yeah, just exploration, just being adventurous and outdoors. Um, yeah, my girlfriend and I are both avid backpackers, and so trying to squirrel away bits of time where both of us can get away and do that is, is special. One of the things I love about this area in particular is like all the good stuff is smashed into one spot. You've got mountains, you've got the, the coast, you've got, you know, deep forests and then not far away you've got high desert and, you know, so yeah, there's a lot to explore just within a few hours of right, right being at home. And then Portland's got all kinds of cool neighborhoods to go explore. And, Kicking around Portland is fun too. All right, that's all the questions that I have for you. Uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover today? No, I think that got it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Happy to. Coming out to share your story with us. Yeah. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Okay, great. Thank you.